evening. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Wade Menezes. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. What? What? Father Wade Menezes? Your host, Father Wade Menezes, but it's Monday. <laughs> well, we could say maybe the, the Italian has stepped aside for the Portuguese, or simply I think it's better wearing the Portuguese is just stepping in for the Italian. Or the, or the, <laughs> he's actually half Polish, half Italian. Oh, half Polish, there you yeah, go. Yeah, his father's yeah. Polish, mother's Italian, and okay. uh, yeah, so Well, I'm full-blooded Portuguese. He's got the, the majority, <laughs> well, between the two of you, you've got the majority of Europe covered, so we're, 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 we're we've got you, co- got him covered hither and yon. So anyway, John Martinoni, a little bit under the weather today, please keep him in your prayers. He assures me that he has not traveled to China recently. And uh, just recovering from a little bit, a uh, little bug that he had had caught. So uh, Father Wade happened to be on campus and uh, was gracious enough to agree to fill in. Um, so we're still going to talk scriptural apologetics, as we always do here on Open Line Monday. But also, if you've got a faith, family, and fellowship question, uh, we can probably work that in as well with Father Wade in the house. The number to be on the program is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com. Or you can text your question to Father Wade. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response, text your first name and your question, message, and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is uh, Mr. Ryan Penny. And Jeff Burson, fabulous person, handling our social media endeavors, and our host, as he is not hardly ever on Mondays, Father Wade Menezes. How are you? I'm doing great. Good to be here on campus these few days. So glad to help uh, pitch hit for John. Well, there you go. What brings you into town? Uh, A couple things. I'm doing some Facebook uh, tapings for uh, Michelle Johnson and our communications office. Uh, Also going to be doing open line here tomorrow live and doing a pre-tape show as I'll be in Canada the following week. So we're going to pre-tape the second show tomorrow. And then uh, also with Father Mitch on uh, EWTN Live on Wednesday night about my new book. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to be on EWTN Live Wednesday night. Great, great. How about that? We'll see you there. There you are. (laughs) We'll be there. It's all Father Wade all the time here at EWTN. Uh, We've got our our, uh, our, uh, email question to, to kick things off here. And uh, Pamela writes in, regarding the Eucharist, why is it not mentioned in the Bible other than the Gospels? If it's so important to our faith, why didn't they talk about it? Well, that's a very good question. Remember, uh, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, huh? That's, that, that's a good uh, analogy. Uh, doctrine develops, and as Eucharist means thanksgiving from the Greek, and as the gathering to celebrate the Eucharist uh, became stronger and stronger in the immediate aftermath of our Lord's ascension into heaven, especially after his ascension into heaven, uh, the gathering to give thanks uh, within the Christian community grew stronger and stronger. And so that would be the primary reason. Uh, and then at, through that, the, the, the uh, spreading of the faith in, into the, the Greek territories and throughout the world, that St. Thomas is known to have gone to India, for example, uh, and the celebration of the Eucharist as, in, quote, an act of thanksgiving per se became stronger and stronger, the word Eucharist was applied to it. And uh, we don't have the word Eucharist per se in Scripture, just as we don't have Trinity. But so. I would argue if you've anybody who's been to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama, uh, Mother Angelica had constructed there behind the castle yes. a way of the Eucharist That's right. uh, in the spirit of the way of the cross. And I think you could very easily make the case that the Eucharist is mentioned throughout sacred scripture, Old and New Testament. Yes, that, that's correct. Although I think I think Pamela's talking about the, the word per se right. of Eucharist. But yes, the twelve stations of the most holy Eucharist, Jack, and that's a that's a beautiful thing to bring up right behind the Castle San Miguel, similar as 
we would walk the stations of the cross, the 14 stations. Mother developed the 12 stations of the Most Holy Eucharist. Uh, there are seven, I believe, that are Old Testament and uh, five that are New Testament. And uh, for example, the raining down of manna uh, on the Israelites after they left Egypt from their slavery, that mysterious bread-like substance. Uh, the high priest Melchizedek, the first one known to mysteriously have offered bread and wine, uh, the high priest Melchizedek. So these are all foreshadowings or types, capital F or capital T, foreshadowings or types of the Eucharist that was to come. And uh, then, of course, we have, for example, the, our Lord's first public miracle uh, happened at a wedding feast when he changed uh, not water into wine, but he changed water into the best of wine, we're told very specifically in Scripture. So that's, that's a type or symbol of the Eucharist that would come already in the New Testament, but would become officially at the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. You know, I've often walked to those stations and thought to myself that if I were uh, a Christian of another stripe and and actually took the time to walk through that, I would have to do some serious soul searching about what I know, knew and didn't know. And I think that probably my guess would be that the overwhelming number of our evangelical brothers and sisters really don't understand what the teaching of the Eucharist is right. in the Catholic Church. And yeah. Going through something like that, I think, would have to at least make them reflect a little bit on what they know and what they don't know. Right, right, and and, and research those scriptures, the, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament ones, and see what the Church Fathers, writing in the earliest centuries of the Church, those who were in closest proximity historically to, to the Apostles directly, uh, the early Church Fathers, bishops, writers of the Church, what they would say about those passages. Um, I think we've got a great opportunity here uh, in the first part of the program. We've got a couple of people that have held over from Dr. David Andrews and called to communion that uh, I think would love to hear almost as much as David Andrews' answer to a question or two. They might very well like to hear Father Wade's answer to some of these. And one of those would be Susie in Flint, Michigan, who's a first-time caller listening to EWTN on Ave Maria Radio. Susie, you are on with Father Wade. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm calling uh, because I, I wondered, um, that was a good uh, good information on the Eucharist. And um, basically, I'm calling because recently I have seen that when communion is served, and um, it'll either be uh, one of the priests or a deacon, uh they take several wafers in their hand and hand them out that way instead of taking one at a time from the dish. Is this something new? Yeah, uh, Susie, thank you for your question today. We appreciate your call from Flint, Michigan. Uh, yeah, I, I've never seen that myself. There's one person receiving in front of the deacon or receiving in front of the priest, or I should say receiving from the deacon, receiving from the priest, or one person at a time receiving from the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, uh, regardless of who's distributing, whether it's the extraordinary ministry of communion, whether it's the deacon, whether it's the priest, they have one person in front of them only at a time, and this, whether the person be standing, receiving directly on the tongue, or standing, receiving uh, directly on the hands, uh, or whether kneeling, receiving directly on the tongue, or kneeling, receiving directly on the hands, uh, regardless of those four ways of how one receives, and those are the four ways we can receive, by the way, uh, two ways of standing, two ways of kneeling, and those two ways, again, are either on the hand directly or directly on the tongue. Uh, regardless of which one of those four ways a person receives, the distributor of Holy Communion, whether an ordinary minister is a priest or deacon, or whether an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, uh, it only has one person in front of them at a time, so that's that's all I've seen. Uh, now, I, I will tell you this, this has happened to me several times, sometimes two hosts will stick together, and so while I'm holding the ciborium that's filled with consecrated hosts, and I go to grab one to give to the next person in line, if I see that a second host is stuck to it for whatever reason, maybe it's through the factory process of the making of the consecrated of the making of the hosts prior to their being consecrated, I have to wiggle them between my index and forefinger to quickly and gently break them apart. And then one one releases and goes, you know, with the rest in the ciborium. And then I stay I stay hanging on to just the one, and then I distribute that one. So that's all I've seen. Uh, maybe you saw something like that. 
and thought that the priest had multiple hosts uh, in his hand. Now, sometimes you'll have a person come up for Holy Communion who's holding a pyx, and the person holding the pyx will show how many how many hosts they need in the pyx because they're going to go visit the sick directly after mass. So let's say they're going to hold they're going to see three sick people, and so they hold up three uh, hosts. Uh, three fingers for three hosts, and the and the the distributor of Holy Communion puts those three hosts in the picks first, and then the fourth host goes into the goes to the person who's receiving communion. Now, that's not the ideal. The ideal is to give your picks uh, to the celebrant before Mass, and then come and get the filled picks after the Mass. Eight three three two eight eight E W T N is our toll free number. 833-288-3986. Father Wade Meniza sitting in for John Martinoni on EWTN's Open Line Monday. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Part of the success we've had on the world over, I attribute to certainly my relationship with Mother Angelica and her teaching me early on that when you sit with someone, you talk to them, you share with them, and you create an environment where they will tell you things they wouldn't tell anyone else. The World Over with Raven Arroyo, Thursday night, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio. 60 Seconds with Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Because God knows all things and because he is creator, it follows that every single thing in the world was made according to an idea or a pattern existing in the divine mind. Look round about you. You see a bridge, a statue, a painting, a building. Before any of these things began to be, they existed in the mind of the one who designed or planned them. In like manner, there is not a tree, a flower, a bird, an insect in the world that does not in some way correspond to an idea existing in the divine mind. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, one of the biggest targets of the enemy in our day and time is the family. And we have several programs here on EWTN Radio to try to help you strengthen your family and uh, help you navigate this minefield and this battlefield that we find ourselves in from a spiritual standpoint. One of those shows is More to Life with Dr. Greg and Lisa Popcheck. Check in tomorrow morning uh, where their topic will be Happy Home will help you to create a closer, more connected, happier home life. That's More to Life with Dr. Greg and Lisa Popchek tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time, right here on EWTN Radio. A couple of open lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Next up is Joel in Waterloo, Iowa, listening at EWTN.com. Joel, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Hey, I have a question that a friend doesn't believe in the afterlife between death and the resurrection, and I just wanted to get some Bible verses that would help him see what that is. Okay, great, Joel. Thank you so much for your for your call. You know, there's a wonderful section in the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church on the particular judgment, which is when the individual dies himself or herself, but before the final judgment— wherein the particular judgment is ratified for all to know what it is and why it is what it is. And that section begins at number 1030 in the Catechism, and I direct you to the Catechism because the Catechism is an absolute wonderful compendium 
of not only sacred scripture, which it sounds like your friend will especially benefit from because they want to know particularly scriptural passages, but also the Catechism's a wonderful compendium on these different topics, in this case the the uh, particular judgment, uh, also from sacred tradition and from the magisterial documents of the Church, like the Second Vatican Council, what it had to say about reiteration, reiterating the, the Church's time-honored teaching on her eschatology, which is the study of the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Uh, but, but beginning in that section of number 1030, the final purification or purgatory, uh, and also the particular judgment, we have uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9, we have Revelations 22.5, uh, Matthew 25.21 through 23. Uh, we also have 1 Corinthians 3.15 and 1 Peter 1.7. You can go back and, and listen to the podcast and jot these down. Uh, I don't expect you to be writing them, in, th- writing them down now. Uh, but 2 Maccabees is very clear that there's a need to pray for the dead. Uh, now remember, common sense tells us if they're in hell, there's no need to pray for them. Uh, because no prayers will benefit them in hell. If they're in heaven, it's rather their prayers benefit us, <laughs> not our prayers them. Why? Because because they've already have received the crown that does not wither, as St. Paul tells us in the New Testament. So why pray for the dead? Well, because we have a, a hope for their release from a purgation. It's a holy and pious practice to pray for the dead. That, again, that's 1 Corinthians 3.15 and 1 Peter 1.7, along with 2 Maccabees 12.46. Uh, 1 Peter 1.17 talks about as though passing through fire. Uh, 1 John 3.14-15, Matthew 25.31-46. through 46. As, as far as some of the saints, we have a St. Cyprian, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom. These are all uh, from the first four and a half centuries of the Church. Church. Uh, I mentioned the Church Fathers and the importance of their writings at the beginning of the show. Um, also the Council of Lyon, as far as um, ch- magisterial documents go, that was held in 1274. We have this, the Council of Florence, 1439, um, and also the Second Vatican Council reiterated the Church's eschatology, which ran from 1962 to 1965. Uh, the word eschatology means simply the study of the last things. You know, we talk about theology, the study of God, um, sacramentology, the study of the sacraments, Mariology, the study of Mary, the Blessed Virgin. Uh, well, eschatology, from the Greek word eschaton, which means the last, is simply the study of the last things, which in Catholic uh, moral theology and dogmatic theology means the four things of death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Uh, three of which will apply to each one of us personally, right? Death, judgment, heaven, or hell, because it's impossible for the church to go to, uh, it's, it's possible, impossible for the soul, excuse me, to go to both locations. Uh, the particular judgment itself, uh, Joel, is talked about uh, beginning with number 1021, under the heading of the particular judgment, which talks about the fact that the soul is judged immediately after death, and that runs through uh, 1023, then there's, there's a discussion of heaven. Now remember, all of these things, and then after heaven, hell, and then the, the, the general judgment. Now remember, all of these headings that I just gave you out of the Catechism, are from Article 12 of the Catechism, which is broken down by the wording of the Creed, uh, those 40-plus truths of the Creed. Article 12 in the Catechism gives us the, the heading, I believe in life everlasting. Words from the Nicene Creed from 325 A.D., Okay, so all of these areas, particular judgment, general judgment, uh, heaven, hell, prior purification and purgatory, if the soul needs it, uh, etc., these are all under the grand headings, uh, heading of uh, Article 12, I believe in life everlasting, because the whole catechism, this entire compendium of scripture, tradition, and the magisterium is broken down accordingly to these 40-plus truths uh, of the Nicene Creed. Again, it comes to us from the Council of Nicaea. By the way, if you're ever in, the, in Washington, D.C., and you visit the beautiful mother church of this wonderful country of ours, these United States, the Basilica Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, Back toward the end of 2018, the Grand Dome of the main aisle of the upper church. It's a huge dome. It's one of the biggest domes in, in the Western Hemisphere. On the, it's beautiful mosaic of the Blessed Trinity and many, many American saints, and some non-American saints, but many American saints in our 200-plus year history as a nation. But what's on the rim, uh, Joel, of, of this entire Grand Dome and these brilliant, brilliant mosaic colors of the bright gold, the bright blue, etc., um, is the entire wording 
of the Nicene Creed. That tells you how big the dome is. <laughs> so it's it, to, to experts, um, experts who have spoken on the dome since it was officially finished, they say that to their knowledge, it's the only such depiction of the creed uh, in the entire world like that. Does that help, Jill? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Dominic is watching us on Facebook Live as we give a little wave to Dominic. He says, are addictions mortal sins? I'm currently fighting a form of it, and I'm worried about the state of my soul when I succumb to temptation. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, thank you so much for that question. You know, the Church teaches that in order to sin, you have to will it. And if there's no will in it, there's no sin. Now, often with um, issues, dependencies, and addictions, as you say, Dominic, uh, especially with, with, with addictions, um, I think it's a higher level of control over the person as, say, an issue or a dependency, although each one can lead to the other one that's above it. So issues can lead to dependencies. Dependencies can lead to full-blown addictions. Uh, the will is not often fully engaged, and again, in order to sin, you have to will it. Now, that teaching is a teaching of the Church. So what could be objectively mortally sinful in this particular instance, in this particular person, is venially sinful. Now, that said, that does not excuse the person from sincerely striving to try to overcome the addiction, the dependency or the issue, by seeking out the appropriate helps. For example, like any of the 5A organizations, the five anonymous organizations, there's, there's um, Alcoholics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Anonymous, uh, Sexaholics Anonymous, and was that four or five? And, and Five, and uh, so they all have the, the they all use the twelve step program. So, for example, enrolling in one of those to help overcome your addiction. Uh, incidentally, um, in in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in number twenty three fifty two. Uh, we read this, to form an equitable judgment about the subject's moral responsibility and to guide pastoral action, one must take into account the affective, that, that means the affections, the emotional affections, one must take into account the affective immaturity that the person possesses, the force of the acquired habit, meaning its, its control over the person's life, and also conditions of anxiety that the person might suffer from, from, from other issues that he or she might have, or other psychological or social factors that can lessen, if not even reduce to a minimum, moral culpability of the action. That's number 2352, which also talks about the sin of masturbation, but even though it's talking about how psychological factors and force of habit, etc., can lessen the, the, the gravity of the sin of masturbation, um, it's also a paragraph, the one I just read to you, that applies to the alcoholic, that applies to the lust addict, that applies to the recreational uh, drug abuser, that applies to the prescription drug abuser, huh? the one who actually has the prescription drug and lawfully can be taking it, but he abuses that. Um, so, yeah, you want to look at t the second paragraph, Dominic, the second paragraph of number 2352 is a great answer to your question. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Mary in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Mary, what's your question today for Father Wade? Thank you for taking my call. And Father Wade, I've been to many conferences where you've spoken, and I've read many of your books, and I'm very glad that you're on today. My question is, um, well, during Lent, there are some friends of mine that are members of the Catholic Church who are doing small groups and that are doing yoga. And I just wanted to know what the stance is for um, Catholics for participating in yoga. Well, I'll tell you what you do with those Catholics that you know. You send them to Women of Grace. <laughs> to listen and read about all that Johnette Williams, Jack's lovely wife, and Sue Brinkman, who works very closely with Johnette, has said about the dangers of yoga. You're not going to find any clear, cut, and dry church teaching, to my knowledge, that says you can't do it. But let me tell you what, these women make some excellent, excellent cases on why not to do it. Why would you play by the cliff and risk running 
into a portal that can lead you down a road deeper and deeper into Eastern non-Christian spirituality, or a portal that could lead you into uh, things that are related to occultic practices. Uh, I'm not saying that would happen to every person, but the, the, but if I see someone doing something by a cliff that they shouldn't be doing, I'm going to guide them away from that cliff's edge. And so uh, I strongly urge you, I don't have much time here because of our break coming up, but you want to go to Women of Grace. Dot com and look up uh, the on the search bar there at the homepage would be anything to do with yoga, and you're going to find some fantastic resources. And you'll find that under the New Age section of uh, the uh, Women of Grace website. While you while you're at it, while you're at it, uh, also look up the Vatican document on the New Age, which mentions in passing yoga with great caution. Uh, again, um, the more and more we're finding out about it uh, and, and what the proponents of it from the Eastern uh, view of thing, Eastern spirituality view of things is, I, I would advise against it. God bless you, Mary. We appreciate that phone call. Still plenty of time for your calls. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Amanda. Hang in there, Amanda. You're up next. Carolyn, Nathan, and hopefully you as well. The number's 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line Monday, Father Wade sitting in for John Martinoni. Dr. Ray Gurindy. Be grateful that you came to the faith when you did. Let the children see what mom is like now compared to how they were raised before mom or dad came to the faith. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Unplanned, the true story of Abby Johnson. I would be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. She believed in a woman's right to choose. I've had an abortion myself, so I don't have any problem with another woman making the same decision. Until the day she saw something that changed everything. Tiny, perfect little baby. And then it was just gone. Now she's pulling back the curtain on the abortion industry. Unplanned. Available at EWTNRC.com and the EWTN app. I worked in pro baseball for a long time, and we'd play on Sundays. And it was an easy excuse. I, I took the easy out and just didn't go to Mass. Got caught up in that whole selfishness, that whole, you know, um, I can do it all. The times when I was struggling were the times I needed God the most. And now that uh, I've come back and accepted God, my world has completely changed. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. EWTN, communicating the faith. I had to go through fear and thank God that I overcame the fear and I just left it up to God and now there's no more fear, there's just acceptance and I'm just learning to listen. If you want to be closer to God, you just need to keep following His rules and your application, your radio station has helped me to always be positive and continue to listen to the rules and obey. EWTN, live truth, live Catholic. Hi, this is Johnette Williams. We bring you the truth of the Catholic faith on Women of Grace tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio. And now back to Open Line with John Martinoni. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Back to the phones we go. Next up is Amanda in Victoria, Texas, a first-time caller listening on the iHeartRadio app. Amanda, thanks for holding on. You're on the program. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, Amanda. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Um, I was just... Because I'm a cradle Catholic. I absolutely love my faith. I went ahead and married my husband about four years ago. And he's, he was Baptist at the time, and now he's wanting to convert to be Catholic. So, of course, the inner me is extremely excited. I'm jumping for joy. Um, it's all his him, though. I'm not pressuring him whatsoever. However, with that comes a lot of ill remarks from my in-laws and from the rest of his family. Um, and they kind of got me thinking with the question, and they kind of told me, they said, oh, well, Catholics, y'all just worship statues and this and that, and of course, I defended it, and then they said, well, y'all speak in tongues, 
And I said, and I kind of just stayed quiet. And I thought to myself, wait, what? And I kind of just stayed quiet. And that's the reason I'm calling. I'm not 100% sure about that. I've never heard about it. And okay. I've always listening to y'all's radio. And I was waiting for a question similar to this. Well, thanks for your call. We appreciate it. So you're saying that your in-laws said that Catholics do speak in tongues as though yes. as though it was a, a type of derogatory thing. Is Am I understanding your statement correctly? Yes, they and said what, that, that it's as if we're possessed or something. And, okay. Okay, and out of curiosity, what, what faith tradition do your in-laws come from? What main, I presume Protestant, since they're not Catholic, what mainline Protestant branch do they stem from, and do they practice that branch? They come from, they're Baptist. Okay. And they do practice it. Okay, because Baptists believe in speaking in tongues. That's why I'm asking that question. So I, I don't understand exactly why they mentioned the speaking in tongues as a derogatory, unless, unless it's as you say, they, they meant it kind of like possession. Now, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and one of those gifts, as, as Scripture explains so clearly, can be speaking in tongues. There's administrative gifts, there's teaching gifts, there's prophetic gifts, there's speaking in tongue gifts. But the Church always has taught that any gift granted the individual is to be supervised by the authority of the Church. So the Church, let's say an individual parish priest of a parish, he would never permit, if he was a good, holy, strong pastor, Catholic priest of his Church, he would never permit... Uh, a a lay group in his parish to meet on Tuesday nights in the parish hall to speak in tongues without any supervision whatsoever. To me, that would be a portal to the occult. The devil would want to play with that. The, the devil would want to uh, toy with those individuals' spiritualities and, and, and minds. Um, there's a great—maybe we can research this, act, Jack. There's, there's a great book out right now. I forget the woman's first name. Her last name is Waddell, uh, Making Intentional Disciples— Making Intentional Disciples, I think I might even have it here, um, uh, where, where it's a program for a parish, again, to be guided by the pastor of the parish, to discern and discover... Sherry Waddell. Sherry Waddell. I think she's been on Waddell, W-E-D-D-E-L-L. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she's been on Father Mitch's program. Okay, great. And w maybe you can research that on YouTube, one of Father Mitch's EWTN live shows with her. What's her first name again? Sherry. Sherry. Sherry Waddell. Uh -huh. um, and see what she said. Her, the thesis of her text is this, and it's also made into a parish program. Her thesis is this. We need to discover what our gifts are precisely so that we can grow in those gifts. We need to discover what our gifts are precisely so that the devil doesn't toy with them. Okay, So speaking in tongues is possible, but not in an occultic way. Now, we do believe that possessed persons can speak in—one in, uh, of the signs of possession is speaking a foreign language. We do believe that. That's one of the chief signs of possession. Uh, but I don't think that's how you're, you're phrasing the question. So um, I have a sheet here, if I could find it. Uh, it's the main signs of, of uh, the chief main signs of demonic possession. Here it is. The four most common signs of demonic possession, these are listed, by the way, in the Roman ritual itself. Uh, an aversion towards sacred things, uh, speaking in unknown or dead languages, uh, having extraordinary strength that goes beyond the person's nature, and number four, knowledge of concealed or hidden things. Now, those are the four most common signs of demonic possession listed in the Roman ritual. So uh, speaking in non unknown or dead languages um, is, is maybe what your in-laws are talking about. Uh, Latin is a dead language. The Church celebrates her, her, her sacred liturgy in Latin, but that's not, it's not a sign of demonic possession in that sense. You know? So um, uh, I, I, would, I would look at Waddell's book, Sherry Waddell's book, and, and become well-equipped uh, with what with with what the church teaches on the gifts, both the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the twelve the the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts for governing the church. But because the church is hierarchical, we always have the church's hierarchy involved in the overseeing of the expression of those gifts. By the way, number two, speaking in unknown or dead languages would be because the person has absolutely no knowledge of those languages, and here they are speaking them. That's the reason why it's sign of possession. Does that help you out at all, Amanda? 
Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. It just really threw me off guard. Like I said, they always pick at stuff, and I always defend it. My husband always tells them, you know, stop. We don't, we don't um, criticize their religion. I just kind of like what I say. I'm like, we all believe in God. That's the main thing to me. There's no need to pick at, you know, someone else's religion, you know. So it just kind of got to me. But that one did get me thinking. I had never gotten that question before. So I was very no, you, intrigued to find out the answer. So I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you speak with goodwill. You know, there, there is no need to poke fun at other people's religion, but there is a need to share the fullness of the Catholic faith with others. So you want to be well equipped and you show goodwill in calling today for the question. So I would recommend Sherry Waddell's book. I would also go to frequently asked questions of the following two websites. Catholic.com, which is Catholic Answers out of San Diego, and EWTN.com here in Irondale, Alabama. Uh, both have a Frequently Asked Questions section, FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. And I have in the past looked up Speaking in Tongues, and I know these two websites will give you great uh, answers in a, in a synthesis where you can share those with others. And maybe, let, let's say it was a, a brother-in-law who said this to you. You don't have to say which in-law it was. Uh, next time you see him, have a, the printout of it and say, you know, last time I saw you at the family gathering of so-and-so, at so-and-so's house, you mentioned something about speaking in tongues. I pre- wanted to share this with you. It kind of explains what Catholics do believe. And I'm glad you asked the question because it made me go ahead and, and want to research it myself. In other words, put the onus on you. Let the person know in humility you weren't that equipped, but by gosh, you went and checked on it and you became equipped and now you want to share the truth with him or her. God bless you, Amanda. We'll keep you in our prayers. 833-288-EWTN is your ticket to the program. 833-288-3986. Next up is Carolyn in St. Louis, Missouri, listening to EWTN on Covenant Radio. Carolyn, you're on with Father Wade. Hi. Hi, Uh, Carolyn. Okay. Uh, Father, uh, my question is... um, I'm wondering about the rules for fasting during Lent, if they vary from diocese to diocese. In other words, is it the bishop that decides the rules, or is there a strict uh, ruling from uh, church, regular church teaching for all people? Uh, and I don't know if that would vary from the different rites involved, you know. Right. But, uh, like for the extraordinary form of the Mass or the Novus Ordo rite, uh, if those rules, regulations for fasting during Lent would be the same and what they would be. You're going you're gonna to feel really good after this phone call, Carolyn, because there won't be any doubt in your mind when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carol, I want to urge you to go to usccb.org. That's United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, usccb.org. On the search bar, simply put in Lenten fasting. It'll come right up. I did this last week for the opening comments of my show. Last week, I talked about the significance of 40 and what 40 means in Scripture. That was on Open Line Tuesday. Today, of course, I'm filling in for John Martinoni on Open Line Monday. Um, But I, I, I did mention that Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are obligatory days of both fasting and abstinence. Uh, abstinence means refraining from from meat. So Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are days of both fasting and abstinence. In addition, Fridays during Lent are obligatory days of abstinence from meat, but not fasting. Um, All other Fridays of the year, some 45 of them, are to be observed as days of penitential observance. So for members of the Latin Catholic Church, the norms on fasting are obligatory from age 18 until age 59. And when fasting, a person is permitted to eat one standard-sized meal, called a full meal, as well as two smaller meals that together are not equal to the one full meal. Uh, The norms concerning abstinence from meat are binding upon members of the Latin Catholic Church from age 14 onwards, regardless if they worship at the ordinary form or the extraordinary form. Uh, Members of the Eastern Catholic Churches are to observe the particular law of their own Suri Uri's Church, so, for example, there's 23 Eastern Rite churches, each in union with Rome, in union with the successor of St. Peter. So, so, for example, the Byzantine Rite, uh, the Egyptian Coptic Rite. Uh, these are, are two of the 23 rites that are out there of the Eastern Church. They each have uh, the ability to impose their own uh, based on, on culture, etc. But for the Latin Rite, there's only that one, the, the Latin Rite. The Western Church is, has only one rite, and it's the Latin Rite. So it's binding for all of us Latin Catholics. Uh, if possible, the fast on Good Friday is continued until the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday night as the great Paschal fast in order to honor the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and to prepare ourselves to share more fully and to celebrate more readily his resurrection. Um, so again, beginning uh, with on Good Friday, which is a day of both fasting and absence, we want to include that through the celebration of the Easter Vigil and then celebrate after the Easter Vigil. So does that help you out? Again, usccb.org has a full-page printout ready to print out on your home printer to, to guide you in, those, in that very answer. Okay. That's excellent, Father. I thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, Carolyn. We appreciate the telephone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Jose in South Bend, Indiana, listening on Redeemer Radio. Jose, you're on with Father Wade. Uh, hi, Father Wade. Uh, it's the first time I talked to you, so oh, it's well, great. Well, glad, um, glad to have you call, Jose. Thank you so much for your call today from yeah. South Bend, Indiana. Yes, uh, the, reason I'm, the reason I'm calling is because um, I have a brother that is getting married. And uh, he used to live here in South Bend, but he, they, he moved to New York with uh, his fiance. And they are um, they got engaged, so they're, I think it's, it's going to be next year that they're getting married. And he told me also that this weekend he called me because I guess they're going to start their uh, marriage preparation. Uh-huh. And he he called me to see about if I could be, I guess, somehow involved or something. But I think what it is is he wants to, if if there's anything that I could give him, you know, as far as for to accompany their marriage preparation. So hearing you talk today, I, I wonder if you have any kind of material or uh, books or things that I could uh, send to him or tell him about so that he could be, I think what it is, you know, my brother has had, you know, the um, doubts of the faith and stuff, you know, he's a, I, I, I could say that he practiced, but the fact that they, you know, they decided to go and live together before getting married and all this stuff is because he has a lot of this, uh, I guess, new age ideas and stuff okay. about just doing whatever. Sure. So that's why I, I would like to see if you have, if you know anything that I do. would be good, uh, solid foundation stuff that they could, you know, they could uh, sure. share with each other. Now, Jose, when you say that they're taking their marriage prep, and he called you to tell you that they have begun their marriage prep, I presume you believe that they're doing that through their local parish. Is that correct? Because mar- the Catholic Church yeah. requires six to nine months of marriage preparation, and the diocese can govern that three-month leeway. Uh, so they're doing it through their church, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, in New York. I would have him be very, very honest with the priest and with the person who's running the courses, which could be a husband and wife team that's running the course for them on behalf of the pastor, although it, it would include some meetings with the pastor, I'm sure, but the, the regular classes themselves can be taught by lay people. Um, I would ask your brother and his fiance to be very open and forthright with them, the pastor and the person teaching the course or the person teaching the course, that they are living together and that this can be a stumbling block to God's grace in the preparation for their marriage. Um, it's important to pursue your marriage preparation in a state of sanctifying grace without any known mortal sin. And if you do fall into mortal sin, you want to get back to confession as, as soon as is, is reasonably possible, the Church teaches. Um, you said they're living together, which automatically implies uh, that the sin of fornication, that is, relations between the unmarried, is taking place, and that's a block to God's sanctifying grace. It just takes one mortal sin to block that. The two things that I, I want to recommend to your brother to read, uh, and his fiance, whether she's Catholic or not, because she's married in the Catholic Church, if she's not a Catholic, it sounds like your brother is definitely Catholic, because you are. Um, the common sense to me tells me your brother's a Catholic. She may or may not be a Catholic. Um, but two things. Number one, a wonderful little paperback book by Archbishop Fulton Sheen, whose cause has been introduced. It's titled, It Takes Three to Marry. In other words, the bride, the groom, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It takes three to marry. You can find used copies of it on Amazon. And uh, I'm sure that even some Catholic publishing houses, like maybe Tan Books and Publishers, um, has reissued it. I'm not aware if EWTN has, has reissued it, but EWTN Publishing, but they may have. But regardless, you'll find it online very easy. It takes three to marry. And then just two weeks ago, Jose, I posted as a blog at the Fathers of Mercy website, at fathersofmercy.com, my own written 25 specifically Catholic tips 
for married couples. 25 specifically Catholic tips for married couples. If you go to fathersofmercy.com and on the home page in the search bar, which you can acquire by clicking on the magnifying glass icon, the search bar immediately comes up. And if you type in that search bar, 25 specifically Catholic tips, 25 specifically Catholic tips or 25 marriage tips, it'll come right up. You can print it out on your home printer. Uh, and have your share those 25 tips with your brother and his and his fiance. Invite them to start listening to uh, the open line programs on EWTN Monday through Friday with the different hosts. I have Tuesdays, which is faith, family, and fellowship, and I get a lot of marriage questions. I'm filling in today on open line Monday for John Martinoni, obviously, but but um, uh, just a couple weeks back, I I covered those uh, 25 marriage tips. By the way, Jack, I think you were absent that day, Jack. I'm going to have to tell Johnette that you were absent (laughs) from listening to Father Wade's 25 marriage tips, and I'm the one who married these two. I can't believe, I can't believe he missed it that day. Because, uh, well, we we, we had got, we had gotten it all. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, apparently so. But, uh, you know, and I don't say that to pat myself on the shoulder with his 25 tips, but I I put a lot of heart and soul into them. I, I hear a lot of confessions, and I say that very generally, and so I wanted to do something that can serve as a synthesis to married couples. Uh, and so that's what inspired me to do the 25 tips. And, and four or five of them on that list, I've called from other great lists, even from our Protestant brethren, but I, I reworded them. I said, my gosh, I've experienced this with married couples myself. This, this rings true with me, but I want to word it in a Catholic sense, in a specifically Catholic sense. But uh, Fulton Sheen's little book, It Takes Three to Marry, is just fantastic. And remember, tell your brother that Father Wade said this, um, the main purpose— And just for clarity, that's called Three to Get Married. Three to Get Married, instead of It Takes Three to Marry. Three to Get Married. Yes. Three to get married. Uh, tell tell your brother and his fiance, your future sister in law, that Father Wade said this: uh, the main purpose of a sacramental marriage, which is what they're striving for, because they've begun their six to nine month instruction. You you told us um, the main purpose of a sacramental marriage is to help get one another into heaven. Again, the main purpose of a sacramental marriage, period, is to help get one another into heaven. Does that help you out, Jose? Oh, yes. Yes, very much. Thank All right. you. Thank you. All right. God bless you, Jose. We'll keep you and your brother in our prayers. Uh, quickly, we'll head to Barbara in Boise, Idaho, listening to EWTN on Salt and Light Radio. Barbara, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Wade. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, talking about marriage, that is my question also. Um, my question is, is I have a nephew getting married this summer, and he was raised Catholic, as his fiancé was also. Um, both of them have not practiced Catholicism in many years now. Um, he didn't get confirmed. He refused to. And our family, you know, our aunt, aunt uncles, grandparents, we're very uh, just in turmoil over this and wondering if, you know, obviously he's our nephew and we don't want to separate him from the family by not going to his wedding, but can we go to his wedding? He's, he's getting yeah. married just, you know, at a, in a field with a, I don't even know who's going to be marrying him. Um, I, we don't, yeah. yeah it, ca- it causes a great turmoil of heart for the Catholic relatives who do practice the faith, who know that what they're witnessing that day is purely a civil, mer- a civil ceremony without the canonical form of marriage for the Catholic who's baptized, in this case both of them, without the proper canonical form. So at the end of the day of celebration, it's a non-valid union in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ and his bride, the Church, which he founded, and which we know by her four marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic, words that we say every Sunday at Mass in the Nicene Creed. And so it causes great turmoil of heart. You are not going to find any specific teaching that says you cannot go to such a wedding, but you can surely reason to it. So this is the answer I give. You can reason to it. In this case, it's particularly more egregious that they're not marrying in the Church. Why is it particularly more egregious? Because both are baptized Catholics. Apart from the fact that they haven't practiced the faith in years, and that one of them, your nephew, the the groom-to-be, 
purposefully shunned his confirmation. That's all besides the fact. The fact is they're baptized Catholics, and as baptized Catholics, they are bound to the canonical form of marriage before a priest or deacon and two witnesses with the proper Catholic ritual. That's the proper canonical form of marriage. It sounds like all three of those are going to be missing that day in the field. So I do not want to actively take part in what is objectively, at the end of the day, objectively, I want to make that clear, I did not say subjectively, I do not want to take part in anything at the end of the day that at the end of the day is objectively a mortal sin. What do I mean by that? Well, at the end of the day, they're going to be getting into bed together, not married in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ and his bride, the church, and that will be displeasing to God. Faith tells me that. One of the three theological virtues tells me that. Now, I've heard the arguments, but Father Wade, Christ went into the homes of sinners. Yes, he did, but it was never in the context of a celebration of a sacrament. It was never in the context of the celebration of matrimony. It was never in the context of the celebration of baptism. Yes, he went into sinners. Yes, we have to dialogue with the sinners. So you want to dialogue with the objective sinner, because again, they may be ignorant to what their canonical form is, okay? Barbara, they, they might be uh, ignorant to what their canonical form is. So subjectively, I'm not saying they're committing a mortal sin. You have to will it to commit the mortal sin. But objectively, they're committing a mortal sin. That's a very important distinction there. Thomas Aquinas says, semper distingue, semper distingue, always distinguish, always distinguish. So, so in order to sin, you have to will it. What do they know about their missing out on the proper canonical form? It sounds like a wonderful opportunity, Barbara, for you and your, your parents, I presume, because uh, you said their grandparents, his grandparents are also disheartened by this, and you're the aunt to the nephew. So I presume it's it's your mom and dad that are disheartened by this as well. How about the three of you getting together with him privately, charitably, and rarely? You shouldn't have to beat him over the head with this. Privately, charitably, and rarely, the three guideposts, the three hallmarks of giving someone fraternal correction, and guide him in that he's doing wrong. Say, say, John, we very much want to go to your wedding. Don't get us wrong, but you're making it difficult for us to do so, and here's why. And gift him with the book. It takes three to marry. Is that it? It, it, it uh, takes three to. It's just. I think it's just three to marry. Three to marry. The the book by Fulton Sheen. Yes, <laughs> paperback booklet by Archbishop. Yeah, and gift him that, and then gift him printed out as well. The beautiful section on the sacrament of matrimony is one of the seven sacramental sections, the universal catechism. Give him that and tell him you're, you will accompany him. Pope Francis talks about the theology of accompaniment. Let's accompany your nephew in getting uh, in touch with his parish priest and his fiance. What a beautiful opportunity that this can be for both of them to return to the Catholic Church. Both of them can return. Let's take this negative and turn it into a beautiful positive. Look at all the Catholic speakers out there that speak about the beauty of their marriages, you know, there, there's there's um, Jason and Kristalina Ever, uh, Evert. Um, they speak beautifully about their marriage. Um, Chris Stefanik speaks wonderfully about his marriage. Get them some podcasts of these great young Catholic speakers who witness about their marriage. Look how Jack and Johnette have have witnessed about their marriage and their formation that I that I put them through um, uh, and to prepare for their sacrament of marriage as being a widow and, and a widower and what a beautiful witness that was to the world as a, as a more seasoned couple, I will say, um, to, uh, and, and they were able to witness to it. So let your nephew and, and his fiance, who's also fallen away Catholic, know about these great tools. Share with them my 25 specifically Catholic tips for marriage. Share with them Fulton Sheen's book. Turn this negative into a positive. God bless you, Barbara. Thank you so much for your phone call today. Where can they find out more about the Fathers of Mercy? At fathersofmercy.com, and we currently have four uh, Come and See Weekends uh, posted there in their specific dates. Would you leave us with a blessing? I certainly will. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of our Open Line Monday listeners and remain with you all this day and always. And keep John Martinoni and his cold in your prayers. St. Joseph, terror of demons. Pray for us. On behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, our 